So let's uh, demonstrate uh, the fact that we need equal time commutators. And let me do it on a generic operator A instead of doing it X and B separately. Let's do that. A. Yes, AH T1. AH T2. Let's consider the same operator first of all, and then I will consider two different operators. And this is then U T1 A U inverse T1 U T2 A U inverse T2. That's the commutator actually. And so what do we have? We have U T1 A U inverse T1 U T2 A U inverse T2 is the first term in this commutator and minus T1 and T2 order are interchanged and you, you just take this for second term first, first term the second. What is this? This is minus I over H bar T1 minus T2H in between. If it was an in between two A's, A would, A would be coming together and it would be A and A and A and A and we would have a cancellation. So what is the way of getting rid of this complication? Obviously, in order to make it an identity, you have to take T1 is equal to T2. If T1 is equal to T2, indeed, if you take T1 is equal to T2, this is an identity operator, then it will be A and A sandwiched between these two and minus again sandwiched between two. It would cancel. And then it follows that AH T the same time AHT is equal to zero. A it could be X and P any operator. So I'm trying to, to, to do it generically. Let's take the A and B, two different operators now. If I take AH T1 and BH T2, then again, think of this, it is A and B in here. If the, or the, the, this product in between is identity, then it would be A and B minus B and A, sandwiched between these two provided that T1 is equal to T2. Therefore, we also take the, them to be at the same time, because I know that the, taking them at different times doesn't make any sense. It, it doesn't it reduce to anything sensible. So if this is the case, then what this becomes is U, T, A and B, U inverse T. Similarly, because perhaps I have to write the same in here. U T A N A U inverse of T. Therefore, this is zero, thus the entire thing is zero. You see the point. So the, it, it is a nice theorem. It tells you that if you take them all at equal time, the Heisenberg picture commutator. Okay. This being so nice, then I can write the Heisenberg picture basic commutators. As the inside is zero, thus this thing is zero. UT, U inverse T is sandwiching from right and left. Similarly, PIT, PJT is equal to U of T, P 
pi and pj u inverse of t <coughs> and this one is zero therefore this is zero if they are taking ethical time time dependent operators again commuting and similarly what comes next is the most interesting one x i t p j t is equal to u x i p j u inverse this is i h bar delta i j times the identity operator i h bar delta i j i move out identity operator of course commutes with any operator so it becomes i h bar delta i j so as before. So it's indeed wonderful that we could recover those uh, algebra, provided that we go to the equal time. Some of you who have been who have taken field theory or presently taken it, you may notice that in the field theory there is this mention of equal time commutators of fields equal time commutators of fields. You see behind it there is this very basic information coming from quantum mechanics, ordinary quantum mechanics and the Heisenberg picture. Commutators make sense only if they are at equal time. Well, this is very important, uh, although very simple, a very important uh, input. And let's see how we are going to use it. Well, because these are the things which are going to be used to come solve physical problems in this new picture. And to illustrate it, let's run quick, a uh, quick uh, attempt to a very simple problem. What is the simplest of all problems? Free particle. Example. particle in quantum mechanics of course in the Heisenberg picture of quantum mechanics in the free in the, in the Newtonian or classical mechanics you know how to do it right so what is the Hamiltonian describing a free particle it is this one pure kinetic energy no potential that's what makes it free there's no force acting on it or there's no potential acting on it so what are the uh, equations of motions, let's remember, for any observable, minus i over h bar, h, a h of t. That is, now I'm using all the indices and time dependencies correctly. A, it could be any operator, x and t, as I said, think of anything else. T is the T. Here's the important question. H. Is H time dependent? We have to settle that first. Well, the H is the same. Hamiltonian is the same in Schrodinger picture and Heisenberg picture. But what more? What more is the H is the Schrodinger picture H which enters into that equation, first of all. Well, I should have put HS first, but we have proven that it is the same as the H. So there is no problem, I drop in the C's. H is label free. It's the same in Schrodinger, same in Heisenberg. But there's another problem which is yet to be settled. Is it time independent? We have seen that all the observables are time dependent. States are frozen in time, observables, observables picked at time except the Hamiltonian. Why? Because if I now take dH Heisenberg dT minus I over H bar H Heisenberg now, Schrodinger Heisenberg T T Not a equation of motion. 
Artıydı değil mi o? Tamam. Bir daha sıfırdan yapmayalım. Doğru. U, bir, U is the first factor, it carries the plus sign, so derivative brings down I over H bar. Good. It's complicated. H is the same. Let's erase. No index, no index. So the, it doesn't distinguish between Schrodinger or Heisenberg, but this one is I'm checking the time dependence. Time dependence. What is the time of here? Or let's go to the very definition. Perhaps better than this is the very definition. This is a bit confusing. It is good, but a bit confusing. Let's take the following. HHT is U I over H bar H Schrodinger T H Schrodinger E to the minus I over H bar H Schrodinger T. Right? This is the definition. So it applies to any operator. It should apply to the Hamiltonian. So this commutes with any function of itself, jumps over, kills the first factor. H of HT is HS. Not only that Hamiltonian is the same in all pictures, it's time independent as well. If it is the same as the Hamiltonian in the Schrodinger picture, which was time independent, like all the other observables, so Hamiltonian is time independent and same in all pictures. That's the theorem. So H is same in all pictures, same in both pictures. We have two pictures in both pictures. That's the first statement. Time independent in both pictures. Well, the first picture, it was time independent because of the very, the property of the Schrodinger picture. Now in the Heisenberg picture, it became time independent because it is the same as before. It's the same as the Schrodinger picture operator. So if this is a very simple, more or less trivial statement, we have to keep in mind, now we, we are in game. Let's go to that equation. These entities, operators, x, p, whatever, are at time t. So what is the time of Hamiltonian? Whichever time appears in here, I will take it to be the time of the Hamiltonian. Can I? Yes, of course. It's independent of time. I can take it to be at any time I like. Why do I need that? You may say, you are talking about something time independent, but you are attributing, assigning a specific time depending on your desire, right? Well, it's so obvious why that I have that need. Hamiltonian is this operator, right? P squared over 2m plus a potential for arbitrary case here. This one, free. <laughs> What is the time of P? Well, I will need that for using commutation relations. If this is P or X, if it is Hamiltonian, would, would whatever that P appearing in that kinetic energy should have a certain time dependence. If I take it to be a different time than this, of course, I cannot run the algebra. I have only equal time basic commutation algebras. So I am free to assign any time I like to this the components of the Hamiltonian, kinetic energy plus the potential energy, as there it is independent of the time. So I will take it to be at the particular time which appears in there. Then I can use the equal time algebra. Let's do that. So D, P, H, T, if you want, we can do it one-dimensional. Let's do it one-dimensional case instead of complicating it with the indices and any higher dimension is trivial. dt is i over h bar ph squared t divided by 2m times phT. Now that we are in game, right? This makes sense. Otherwise, it wouldn't make sense. Well, ph at t, ph squared at t, they commute among themselves. An operator commutes with any function of itself, so this is zero. So PHT is a constant. Let's call it what constant? Constant of motion. 
constant of motion. We can take it to be the independent of time, right? The value of it at t equals zero, p. So let's take the second, you know, conjugate variable and let's run the xh t dt i over h bar ph squared t divided by 2m xh t. At equal time, or else, or else means you are finished. You cannot do any any algebra. So you take the one over two m out, p squared t x t. I dropped the index h. Now I know that I'm talking about the Heisenberg picture operators. What is the? How do you carry out this uh, comm this commutator? P of t p t of x t plus use the decomposition rule first, pt, xt, and pt. pt, xt is what minus ih bar, because at equal time they satisfy the basic rules. So this is altogether minus two, this is one over two m, and we forgot of course i over h bar in the front, Let's put that i over h bar coming from the algebra. 1 over 2m times minus 2i h bar pt. Two. Two i h bar. Twos cancel, h bars cancel, i times i times a minus gives you plus. So this is pt over M. Is this nice? Well, that's indeed nice. Because that gave you the following. dxht divided by t is 1 over mpt. That really defines for you the Heisenberg picture momentum operator being equal to m times the velocity operator. Indeed, a verification of something you are familiar from classical physics. It is the quantum mechanical correspondence principle. So the equation for the x gave you nothing new, and the other one, the p, gave you something interesting that p is equal to a constant. So you can combine these two results to solve the ultimate equation, that is, dx h dt is equal to 1 over m times that pt is a constant. We have taken to be that constant to be the Schrodinger operator p. Then you can integrate this. x h t is equal to another constant operator plus 1 over m or t over m p if you want. How do you determine that constant operator? You see, the manipulations I am carrying out is very much like the classical physics. It's the beauty of this formalism. So if you take at t equals zero, at t equals zero, this is the Schrodinger picture x. And that is zero, so that constant is the Schrodinger picture x. So all together now, x h t. is x plus t over m p x and p without labels are the Schrodinger picture operators. Looks very much like the classical equations, right? But the difference is their classical dynamical variables are replaced by the operators. x is an operator, p is operator, p over m is the velocity operator, so x plus vt. Nothing could be simpler than that, right? Newtonian equations written in terms of the operator equations. So that's the power of the Heisenberg picture. Well, this is, of course, the simplest of all the dynamical problems, so you are not surprised. Some of you should remind me the time. I dropped, I put the uh, watch in the office, so I don't want to override your lunch time. Okay. 
So, of course, the, as I said, the, the results are simple because the problem was simple. It is the free particle problem, no dynamics involved. However, I have to uh, notice, I have to invite your uh, attention to one fact. Free particle problem is a simple problem, is not. As we are going to see in detail this year when we are discussing uh, some problems like uh, atoms in external radiation, then you are going to see that the free particle issue will pop up. And you'll see that in quantum mechanical discussion, particularly in the Schrodinger picture, that problem is a very difficult problem. Because this free particle wave functions are not renormal, are not normalizable. And that lack of normalization is a major challenge in quantum theory. And we will develop certain uh, rather sophisticated methods to overcome that difficulty. This is a difficulty. And you'll see that simplest of all the physical problems will involve a very sophisticated technique, so a technique of regularization to get rid of that uh, normalization issue. But here, we don't face any of those complications. It's rather clean formalism, and you have all the operators and solutions are given in exactly the same form as the Newtons. Well, there is a more involved problem. I'm not going to get into that because we are rushing this semester, right? We have to go fast to the relative to quantum mechanics uh, so that people who are teaching field theory could teach directly field theory instead of repeating the relative to quantum mechanics. Eh? So that's the reason why I'm rushing towards uh, the relative to quantum mechanics problem. So the next issue, which in principle I used to do in sometimes in the past, which I'm going to skip, I invite you to work on your own. Try to solve the same problem for the harmonic oscillator. That's going to be a refreshment of your memory if you wish, because you have to eventually run into the game of creation and relation operator business, A's and A daggers. If you solve this problem using the uh, Heisenberg equations of motions I have devel developed X and P. At some point you can relate X and P time dependent X and P solutions in terms of the A and A dagger operators and you can write the Hamiltonian in terms of A and dagger. You can define the number operator A dagger A. You can define the eigenvectors and eigenstates of the number operators and how the number operators are affected by the creation and annihilation operators. That's all subject of 431 or 507. I am sure you have seen it. This is a good illustration of this technique. It's the Heisenberg equation of motion. You may not think that way. You, you may think that all of a sudden there are creations in Heisenberg, uh, creation and annihilation operators. Some people ingeniously thought in, to introduce them to solve harmonic oscillator. No. What they are doing is solving harmonic oscillator problem in the Heisenberg picture. And A and A dagger are just redefinitions of the X and P operators, which depend on time explicitly. And there are some fantastic issues involved in there. Whether those X operators and P operators, which you'll find oscillating solutions, do they have similar physical features that you have in the classical Newtonian solutions of the harmonic oscillator? Uh, or what are the uncertainty issues there? What are the uncertainty products of the delta X and delta P? How that uncertainty product evolve in time? Does it depend on time? If it depends on time, how the right hand side is affected? There are so many issues, but some of them may constitute exam questions. So I invite you, please think on your own. Enjoy yourself. And perhaps at some point I can ask a teaching assistant to devote one session on the actual detailed solution of this. You, you received the internet message from Idris, right? This evening you are going to have a, the first session of the recitation. And he is going to do Zeeman effect and the Stark effect for the first excited state of the hydrogen both constituting degenerate perturbation theory problems. So if you have time, please go. If you have no time, of course, you are, I'm not going to put any pressure on you, but it, it could have been interesting. So you can communicate and discuss and ask questions and even challenge him. So, you know, with the difficult questions if you want. 
So let me move to interaction picture. I'm moving rather fast, you see. Uh, how is the time? 10 minutes? OK. So direct picture. Now I'm going to now split the Hamiltonian into two, H0 and V. This is a preparation towards time-dependent uh, perturbation and time-dependent problems. You have a time-independent part and you'll have a time-dependent part which is going to be turned on at a given time. So the first part is like the non-perturbative part, like, not exactly. This is an exact problem. And what we are going to do next is repeat Heisenberg algorithm not using the entire Hamiltonian, a part of the Hamiltonian, that's the game. In the Heisenberg case, you had one full Hamiltonian, and you were using the entire Hamiltonian to transform from one picture to the other, construct a unitary operator, e to the i over h bar, capital H time t. Here, you are going to use this portion only. And there's very good reason. You'll see at the end of the day when we are finished, you'll see how it's going to happen. So Psi Schrodinger is going to uh, go to a new one. Instead of using U's, let me define directly H0T Psi <coughs> Schrodinger, which I will say Psi of T interaction picture. The more famous label for this is the I, the in for interaction. Perhaps, uh, to be fair, people should have used D for Dirac, but anyway, it, they don't do it. Uh, so we follow the books. And the, the Schrodinger picture observables are, again, defined through this H0 part only, A S minus I over H bar, H0 T, we will call it A interaction of T. Okay. Very good. Now, what we have to do is now, we know that this satisfies the Schrodinger equation. These are frozen in time because we picked them from the Schrodinger picture. And let's check the time dependencies of this new states and observables. So let's focus on the state first. Site. Well, let me, not let, let me not complicate the notation as a shorthand. Let's see d by dt of this interaction picture entity. So d by dt, e to the i over h bar h0 t times psi Schrodinger is the explicit expression of this interaction picture entity. The derivative obviously acts on both. From the first one, it brings down, I hope, I think Rafet wouldn't like this, so I will write it up. So the right hand side is i over h bar h0 comes down, times the exponential itself, e to the i over h bar h0 t psi Schrodinger is the first term. Second term is e to the i over h bar h0 t times d by dt psi Schrodinger. Psi Schrodinger, we know what it is. What is it? It is 1 over i h bar times h on psi Schrodinger. h is the full h, right? That's the Schrodinger equation. When you have the d by dt of the state vector, it should be the total Hamiltonian time h times the 1 over i h bar. What is h? h0 plus v. Good. So, you see, if I rewrite this instead of the entire thing, this becomes minus i over h bar, e to the i over h bar h0 t, the first factor, times h0 plus v, times psi on s. I have just read it in the second term. And then let's compare with the first term. h0 and exponential evolving h0, exponential and h0, so these terms, and that term cancels because h0 commutes with any function of itself, but v term stays. So this right hand side becomes minus i h bar, i over h bar, i over h bar, h0t 
V and Psi Schrodinger. Well, that is obvious, non-zero, but it's not a very elegant expression, right? For anybody's standards. So, so if I write this. But we can immediately save the day by inserting something one in there. What is that one? E to the minus i over h bar, h zero t, times e to the plus i over h bar. h zero t times Schrodinger s. I have inserted an identity, as you see. But that identity saves a lot, because if I use a different color, you see that portion is what? Vi. And this portion is psi of i. How nice. Then right hand side becomes minus i over h bar vi of t psi of i. What is left hand side? Left hand side is d, d by dt psi of i. It's a good point to stop, but let me just illustrate this. What is it? It is a very much like the Schrodinger equation. If I move this factor to the left as i h bar, i h bar d by dt psi is equal to v i on psi. I'm sorry, it's interaction, of course. Please correct this one, psi i. It is exactly the same as the Schrodinger equation, but the role of the Hamiltonian in the Schrodinger picture is picked up by the potential in the interaction picture. You see, states are now carrying time dependence in an interesting manner. We'll see next time that the observables will carry time dependence, very much like the Heisenberg picture equations. There, the role will be taken up by the H0. So the Hamiltonian is split into two, H0 and V. Both of them play an important role in time evolution equations. H0 plays a role in the observable case. V plays a role in the state case. It's a beautiful intermediate picture between the Heisenberg and, and the Schrodinger, and we are going to use it extensively when we discuss time-dependent problems. So that's it for the today.